Hello, my name is Robin Swanick and I'm with AARP Nebraska. I want to thank you for joining us for today's presentation on responses to medication as we age. We are honored to have registered pharmacist Robert Lawson joining us today. Robert is a registered pharmacist and consultant pharmacist in geriatrics with over 25 years of experience. In this session, viewers are going to learn about the age-related changes that occur and how they have an impact on the effectiveness of medications. A review of the most common side effects, risk factors, and guidelines for correct medication consumption will be discussed. Welcome, Robert, and thank you for joining us today. I'm looking forward to hearing about the responses to medication as we age. Thank you, Robin and AARP for the invitation to speak today. Uh, my discussion today will be on the changes in our body as we age and the effects of medication that we take as a result of those changes. So with that, we can move right to the slides. Uh, okay, so the next slide, please. Okay, up the risk factors for older people, uh, up to half of older people do not take the medication as directed. Uh, compliance is always an issue. Uh, I'm thinking primarily of things like uh, anticoagulants. You know, if we miss a dose or half dose it or something like that, it's, it's gonna drastically affect the medication as this medication works by concentrations in the body. So it's a very serious problem if people don't uh, comply and take medications as they're supposed to. Uh, older people are more susceptible to the effects of medication, and we'll go into that a little bit later on another uh, slide. Uh, older people are more likely to have one or more chronic medical disorders, and the problem here you get into is if you're treating one, uh, we all know that all medications have a side effect, we can introduce another side effect or possibly uh, influence the, uh, the medication used for the other condition. Most medications taken by older people are taken for years, and this is an ongoing problem. Uh, in medicine, it's, it's more likely that we keep adding medications on other than uh, trimming them out as maybe we don't no longer need them. So we find that uh, people are taking a lot of medications and you have, have never been questioned regardless whether they need to continue taking those medications or not. This is particularly true if we have specialists involved. Uh, primary care physicians are a little hesitant to uh, change medications by another physician. Among people 65 and older, 90% take at least one medication per week. More than 40% of those people take at least five medications. And so you can see as we continue taking more medications, we're compounding the possible side effects. Women take more medications than men, and uh, that's, that's not really too hard to understand when you look at um, maybe we're treating osteoporosis, which requires not only the, uh, the medication for osteoporosis, but also a calcium uh, supplement and a vitamin D supplement. So now we have three medications added on for one uh, particular uh, disease trait that we're, we're treating. Nursing home residents take up an average of seven and eight different types of medications. In our practice, I've, I've seen as high as 20 different medications for individuals to take. So it's a, it's a serious problem. And again, with each medication, we have a potential for side effect. Uh, next slide, please. As people age, and this is, accounts for some of the effects we have on uh, the way medications work, uh, the amount of water in the body decreases. Uh, most people, when they're hospitalized, are in, in, 65 or older uh, will have some degree of dehydration at the time of admission to a hospital. Uh, medications that dissolve in water uh, now will have higher concentrations because they have less water to be dissolved in. So they're more potent than they would be otherwise. As people age, the amount of fat tissue increases and uh, medications that dissolve in uh, fat and like vitamin A and D, for example, uh, will become more uh, concentrated and we'll have more of them in the body because it's being stored in the fat. Uh, as we age, kidneys are less able to excrete medications uh, in the urine, and this is one of the primary modes of uh, excretion. Uh, the liver is less able to break down uh, many medications effectively, allowing again more drug to accumulate in the body. 
People who take more medications are at higher risk of drug interactions. Uh, we have interactions between the individual drugs as well as those on the systems themselves. And fewer studies are done in older people to establish appropriate doses. So sometimes the dosing for one person uh, who may be a little dehydrated is going to be different from a person who, uh, say, is a little overweight, you know, and it's, it's going to vary on their fat and, and water distribution. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about how medications are developed. And uh, this maybe will explain some of the reasons why we have some of these variables in uh, seniors. The uh, a drug company will first uh, develop a molecular structure uh, that they say will uh, have a certain activity in the body. And they identify this particular molecule and they do some testing on it for possible medication applications. Uh, when they discover one, the new medication is identified and studies in animal models and other drug applications are made with the FDA. Uh, various doses are attempted in the lab to determine effective ranges. Uh, one of the recent cases to look at would be the, the COVID vaccine. Uh, in the studies that they did on that, they had to use various uh, doses to find out which one gave them the immune response that they wanted. So this goes on, and, and this actually went on with that medication also. Uh, Clinical trials are established then for effectiveness, dosing, and uh, side effect parameters that uh, are going to come out with the medication. Candidates for trial are screened for COVID uh, diseases and uh, health concerns. These candidates are normally between 18 and 45 years of age. And the trials are completed. Then the information is submitted to the FDA uh, for marketing approval. Next slide, please. So how do these clinical trials affect uh, the older population? Older people are often excluded because of organ dysfunction and multiple chronic conditions. And we talked earlier about the chronic condition issue. Study concerns arising from comorbidities and uh, concomitant medications. Uh, also, uh, any type of a study, if somebody is having more medications uh, or one of these chronic disease states, um, it's possibly could affect the medication, so they want to exclude those people. Exclusion from the studies provides no information about drug benefit, dosing, and risk in the elderly. A non-random sample of 38 individual trials revealed that more than 60% were excluded because of either liver dysfunction, 58% because of kidney dysfunction, and 37% because of kidney filtration rates. So we're eliminating a lot of the people that would normally fall into the elderly class. Patients with kidney and liver disease may, even after dose adjustments, which does sometimes come out on post-marketing, have effectiveness or safety effects different from patients without this condition. Most studies will conclude that a medication is effective in a percentage of the population. And on the information that we get out in pharmacies, it'll say, 90% uh, effective in, in a group of people. And for a, a number of years, we accepted this and trial and error was really the way we determined whether the medication was going to be effective in somebody. But we've come out with a new process now that uh, identifies that 15, 20% that the medication didn't cover. Next slide, please. It is now understood that some of the variability in how people respond to medications is explained by the way their bodies interact with the drugs. The relatively new field of pharmacogenomics seeks to understand these differences. For some medications, identifying individual genes differences can help customize both the selection of medication and dosing for the best response. In some cases, this testing, this DNA uh, testing will say that, uh, you know, there's no sense in taking this particular medication for this individual because it shows that it's, uh, this testing shows that it's not going to be effective for them. Um, the activity of uh, drug metabolism enzymes, and this is really what makes the difference here, often varies widely among healthy people, making the metabolism highly variable. 
Uh, drug elimination rates in individuals can vary as much as 40 fold though. Genetic factors and aging seem to account for most of these variations. Next slide, please. So I want to talk a little bit about the different types of medication interactions that we see. By definition, uh, an interaction, medication interaction is a disorder, symptom, or condition other than the one for which the medication was prescribed. Now we find that there are four different types of interactions that can occur. We have drug disease, uh, a medication that would be counterindicated because of uh, a particular disease state, drug drug. We have two medications, one will nullify the effects of the other one or compound it in some way. Drug food interactions um, and calcium containing products uh, are probably a, and, and orange juice are big factors here. Orange juice with diuretics is not good. Uh, calcium containing products uh, can tie up uh, antibiotics, tetracycline, other drugs too. Um, and then drug herb interaction. Now, this last one, this drug herb interaction, is one that is commonly um, a problem for practitioners because what we find is that the even though they're available uh, in, in food stores and every place else, these herbs have some interaction potential for medications. So anytime you go to see a physician, you want to be sure to tell them about any types of supplements that you're taking. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, age-related changes and the sensitivity, uh, medications tend to stay in an older person's body longer, prolonging the effect and the increase in risk of side effects. And we mentioned earlier um, the uh, dehydration issue and the uh, fat-soluble uh, medications, including vitamins, and how that would be affected. Small doses of the medications, perhaps fewer daily doses, are better. And an example of this would be uh, digoxin, which is uh, sometimes used to strengthen the heart muscle. Um, this particular medication is therapeutically, has a very what we call a very narrow window of uh, therapeutics. And I think you can probably can, uh, compare this to like a glass of water. You know, if it's full, then that's what we need. But if we add one more drop, then we start having problems with uh, toxicity. And that's the way this particular medication operates. And there's several of them that, uh, that will uh, operate that way. So uh, a, a little bit, uh, you know, if you, you cut the tablet in half or take a little bit more than you're supposed to, it can have some toxic effects in some medications. Older people tend to be sleepier. And I know I personally get afternoon naps once in a while. And are more confused with certain medications used for to treat common things like anxiety and, and insomnia. Medications that lower blood pressure tend to be uh, sometimes uh, lower the blood pressure dramatically and cause uh, problems with what we call posterior hypotension. And that's when you uh, get up from a reclined position or a, a sleeping position really quick and you get real lightheaded. Um, and, and it takes a little while for the uh, the body to get enough blood pressure back up in there to uh, to uh, reestablish your your balance. Now, um, there's this is also a possibility with some medications. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But blood pressure, if we try to get down to some of the levels that uh, are now out there, and they're saying what used to be 120 over 80, now they're even pushing for lower levels than that in some cases. That's not always realistic for um, an elderly patient. Uh, there's some sort of uh, compensatory type uh, activity that we need for a little higher blood pressure. So uh, our target ranges sometimes are not quite as aggressive as they are maybe in the younger population. And then we have probably the biggest offender, uh, which is the anticholinergic side effects. And this can be available on prescription medications that we'll, we'll talk about a little bit, and even OTC products, uh, Benadryl or Diphenhydramine is probably the one that um, you're, you're going to see the most of. Um, but we'll, uh, in the next couple of slides, we'll talk about a little bit more about this anticholinergic side effect. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so what uh, do these anticholinergic side effects look like? Um, the anticholinergic effects are caused by drugs that block the action of acetylcholine in the body. Now, acetylcholine is a chemical messenger. It uh, works between the nerves to transmit signals 
uh, to the neighboring nerves to have a, a reaction. And this can happen to nerve nerve transmission, uh, nerve cell transmission, muscle or gland. So it's a it's a very uh, important um, chemical neuro. Uh, so the next uh, thing that we want to look at, acetylcholine can also help uh, these cells talk to each other, but it also helps the memory, learning, and concentration activities. And this becomes very important as we get a little bit older. Acetylcholine helps control the functioning of the heart, blood vessels, airway, urinary, and digestive organs. Medications that block the effects of acetylcholine can disrupt these normal functions of the organs. Next slide, please. So what do these uh, anticholinergic effects look like? Uh, people tend to be confused, have dry eyes, blurred vision, uh, constipation, dry mouth, lightheadedness and loss of balance we talked about earlier, uh, difficulty starting urination. So it's a systemic problem, not just in one particular area. Uh, the confusion is probably one of the worst problems uh, in, in to have occur. People don't really realize that it's an issue, but uh, for someone who takes like a Tylenol PM, which has a, a uh, antihistamine, diphenhydramine or Benadryl with it, uh, it's very common for the next day to have problems with uh, short-term memory problems. Um, that's part of that acetylcholine blocking that we talked about in the brain. Next slide, please. Okay, older people and the effects of anticholinergics. Older people uh, are more likely to experience anticholinergic effects because the amount of acetylcholine in the body decreases as we age. So we already have a problem. Cells in many parts of the body, such as the digestive tract, have fewer sites where acetylcholine can be attached as we get older. Next slide, please. I'm going to give you an example now of how we get into trouble um, with an individual um, and the acetylcholine or anticholinergic uh, effects. I'm going to give you a patient. Uh, some of the medical concerns of this patient are typical of the elderly. High blood pressure, irregular heart rhythms, depression, early Parkinson's disease, movement disorders, abdominal cramping, heartburn, urinary incontinence, and insomnia. Now, any or all of these uh, conditions are probably very uh, prominent for uh, the elderly. So the high blood pressure medications, uh, what they do, uh, this is more like the calcium channel blockers and, and uh, even some of the diuretics, is they cause uh, orthostatic hypotension. So if we get up too fast, your normal compensatory mechanism in the body will increase the blood pressure to push uh, more fluid up into the brain, so you don't have that happen. But if we are on one of these medications to control blood pressure, that compensatory mechanism is blocked. So we're going to have this get up too fast, you have a light head. Uh, irregular heart rhythms, um, we have used anticholinergic medications to do that. They have side effects of, of um, like calcium channel blockers, things like that. Depression, most of the antidepressants that we currently use. We have anticholinergic side effects, and this orthostatic hypotension is not uh, unusual for that. Parkinson's disease, we have really strong anticholinergic side effects of the medications that you've taken for that. The anti, uh, abdominal anticholinergic side effects for medications for cramps, things like that, um, again, can be very pronounced. Heartburn, if we take a, a Zantac or uh, one of those products, Pepsid, uh, you can have some confusion resulting from that. Urinary incontinence, uh, they have anticholinergic side effects, uh, hesitancy to start. Insomnia, uh, again, with the uh, medications that you use, similar to Ambien, uh, we can have these anticholinergic side effects. And part of the problem with those is they uh, carry over into the daytime, and we have confusion in uh, people that are falling. So with this typical scenario, you can see how uh, we maybe have one side effect that's not such a big thing. We have two or three medications that we're taking, but this anticholinergic overload develops. 
and we have somebody now that uh, maybe wasn't sim uh, didn't have symptoms of this uh, lightheadedness or um, some of these other problems is uh, overloaded and these symptoms become very pronounced. Next slide, please. Uh, some of the other drugs that will cause problems, we'll just touch on briefly here. Uh, the NSAIDs, and I'm going to use ibuprofen here as an example, um, it's used to relieve pain and inflammation, um, it can lead to pe peptic ulcer disease, uh, particularly for somebody that's chronically taking it on an empty stomach. You have stomach bleeds, uh, it can worsen kidney function, uh, it can cause confusion and dizziness in its own right. So uh, again, there aren't any medications that don't have a side effect of some sort. Next slide, please. So medications that we common, commonly see used, uh, the benzodiazepines, um, these are uh, have a calming relief, relief and anxiety. Uh, they're sometimes used for sleeping aids and we can have dependence develop from that or uh, daytime drowsiness, loss of balance, risk of fall, which is always a, a great uh, problem for the elderly, uh, increased in uh, risk of motor accident activities and ac accidents that might happen. Uh, these effects can last several days in individuals. Um, some of the older um, benzodiazepines that are uh, still on the market can have a half-life, and that's how long half the medication stays in the system of, of over 22 hours. So a single dose can have quite an impact on an individual. Hypnotics, um, the biggest problem for uh, the elderly is we we get tired and uh, we go to bed, but in two or three hours we wake up and then we uh, uh, can't get back to sleep. Hypnotics are used as sleeping aids and uh, they should only be used for a short period of time because you develop what's called a rebound insomnia, um, which um, you, you know your body's looking for that uh, drug to uh, put them to sleep and, and you don't. So the next couple of nights, it's, it's gonna be much more difficult to go to sleep. So it should be only be used for short periods of time uh, so we don't have this rebound insomnia. Um, again, Tylenol PM is uh, available over the counter and uh, it's, it's one of the worst offenders because of that uh, daytime uh, effect that we have that carryover. Histamine blockers, these would be the ones for the stomach like uh, Zantac Pepsid that we mentioned a couple minutes ago. Uh, for heartburn, uh, these can have possible increased confusion. They may worsen memories and thinking problems. Uh, there was actually a study even done on the worsening memories to uh, see the direct correlation between taking these medications long term and uh, early Alzheimer's type symptoms. Muscle relaxants, uh, this would be for muscle spasms, back problems, stuff like that. Uh, again, they have the uh, anticholinergic side effect. What they do primarily is to slow down the muscle, uh, the impulse to the muscles, and that uh, relaxes that spasm. But again, as a result of that, we have some weakness, uh, increased risk of fall, and it's uh, questionable use in the elderly. You know, some of these things, uh, the best medication is, is no medication. Uh, next slide, please. Prescribing considerations, uh, these are the things that we should look at uh, when we're trying to treat a, a condition for somebody. Uh, the first consideration should be always be uh, a non-medication treatment. You know, can we take care of this with physical therapy? Can we make a diet adjustment? Uh, anything that we can do in a normal routine that would eliminate this condition without medications, because as we know, all medications have some side effects. Uh, consider starter doses. I think this is a, a good way to do it. Your physician probably will do that. Um, start out with a lower dose and then increase the dosage as it tolerated to the effective level that they want. Um, you know, trying to say that um, this particular individual is going to need this particular tablet, as, as we mentioned earlier with these studies that are done, that necessarily isn't going to match up. Um, that strength of that tablet is based on the clinical studies with it, but as we know, individuals vary from person to person. A geriatrician um, usually will try to make sure that all these medications are for symptoms are serving a useful purpose and improving well-being and quality of life. Again, going back to that uh, 
tendency there is in the medical field to keep adding medications rather than uh, uh, stopping them. Um, and if you have any problems uh, with the medications as far as cost, there's some very, very costly medications out there now, uh, discuss it with your prescriber. Uh, there can be some different regiments that could be trained, uh, tried at different states uh, that of the therapy that may work just as well. Next slide, please. Okay, what you should know. Now, um, as a patient, you should be responsible for knowing several things uh, about your treatment. Uh, you need to keep a list of all the medications being used, and this includes uh, any herbs that you're taking, uh, natural products that you're buying over the counter. Uh, know what medical conditions each medication is being used for. If you're taking something for high blood pressure, it should decrease your blood pressure. If you're taking something for rapid heartbeat, your heart rhythm should go down. Um, if you're taking something for pain, you, you should know that uh, that pain is going to be resolved. So you need to know what that medication is being treated or used for. Uh, you want to know what each drug should do and how it does it, the mechanism of action of the drug. Know the possible side effects and report them if they occur. Now, normally, um, uh, anymore in the uh, the pharmacy world, we, we give you big pages and pages of side effects. And uh, the FDA requires that regardless of anything that ever occurred in the study, as a side effect, it has to be listed. So uh, a better question is, how likely am I to have one of these side effects? And um, while well, I, I think you need to, a person needs to have a list of side effects possible and kind of know what they are, uh, don't look for them. You know, if you're not uh, seeing problems with blurred vision or something like that, and it's a side effect of the medication, don't say, well, I'm not seeing quite as well today as I did yesterday. You know, you want to watch that because you can become a, a paranoid about uh, the side effects of the medications. Know how to take it. Uh, you know, if you should take it in the morning, if you should take it in the evening, once a day, if you should take it with food, without food. Um, you know, these are uh, important things for you to know regarding the effectiveness of the medication. Um, know what to do if you miss a dose. You know, what do you do? Do you take two doses? Do you not take one? Do you skip it? Um, you know, you want to get that information from your prescriber. And then keep a list of all disorders that you have. Now, that information um, you should have it written down, should be available. Uh, should anybody be hospitalized, you want to take out a mission, that in, information along with it, along with a list of medications for the uh, emergency people to uh, have, be able to work with when you get there. Next slide, please. Use medications correctly. Um, take them as prescribed by the prescriber. You know, if you're supposed to take a full tablet daily, uh, take it. Um, if it's an expensive medication and your uh, physician or prescriber has said to take half the tablet a day or something to try to cut the cost on it, take half tablet a day. But always take it as, expect, as expected uh, and instructed by the uh, prescriber. I mean, how are you going to know if it's effective or not if you're not taking it the way the physician had intended you to take it? Use memory aids, including medication organizers. If you are taking several medications and it's not hard to do by the time you put in some supplements and things that uh, you may be taking on your own, uh, you need to put them in there and then put them in that location. You take it in the morning, do you take it in the evening, do you take it at uh, noon? Um, it, it, that helps uh, keep track of the medications. Uh, consult your physician before stopping any medication. This is very serious. Uh, some medications have to be tapered before you can stop them down, and the effects are very, uh, very difficult to deal with. So consult your physician. Say, okay, we, I want to stop this medication, and they're going to put you on a little taper where you take half tablet, fourth tablet every other day or something like that to allow your body to uh, become accustomed to the fact that that medication is not uh, no longer there. Discard any used drugs from previous prescriptions. Um, there's always that tendency to, to keep medications around. Well, maybe this will happen again, or maybe it won't happen again. Uh, chances are really good that that medication is going to be uh, expired, and uh, you don't want to take any expired medications if you ever do need it again. So the best thing to do is uh, to get rid of the medication. 
And most uh, pharmacies now have a, a take back program where you can take your empty vials uh, in or a vial still with some medication and um, they'll uh, take it back and destroy it. This is different with controlled substances, but uh, for our discussion, uh, the pharmacies can direct you to what you should do with that medication. Um, again, do not use past expired date. Some of these can be very toxic, toxic if you do. Probably the biggest uh, offender is the uh, tetracycline class of uh, medications. Next slide, please. Vaccines. Um, as you get older, these are very important. Vaccines may help prevent infectious diseases, and they do this by um, uh, challenging uh, the body with a, uh, a virus or some type of a, in the case of, <clears throat> excuse me, in the case of um, uh, the COVID, they take strands of the DNA and they put that into the uh, vaccine. And then your body recognizes that as a foreign body and it sets up a normal defense uh, mechanism to develop antibodies against it. And uh, so vaccines are very important for uh, a lot of, and I'll, I'll show you a little list later of the uh, approved vaccines for the elderly, but um, that's a good chance to build your immunity up. Uh, antibiotics, you wanna use those appropriately. <clears throat> uh, most people are going to feel better and you know, they'll take medications for four or five days and and they feel better, so they stop taking the medication, even though the medication was prescribed for 10 days. Uh, the problem you get into is that um, you're going to feel better as the antibiotic um, starts taking care of the bacterial infection that's in the body, but it hasn't effectively eliminated that infective agent. So if it, it uh, bottle said take for seven days, take it for seven days, if it says take it for 10 days, take it for 10 days. But what they prescribe, physicians prescribe or practitioners, is what you should be taking. Medications that control high blood pressure. Um, the, the thing about high blood pressure is that it leads to other things, um, strokes, heart attacks. And uh, that's why it becomes very important to um, take those high blood pressure medications as prescribed. Uh, medications that control blood sugar, and we're talking about diabetes here, uh, they enable millions of people with diabetes to lead normal lives. These medications also reduce the risk of eye and kidney problems. One of the problems you have with um, uh, diabetes is the red blood cells become more rigid. And as they become rigid like that, they, uh, and go through these small vascular uh, trees, they tear up those veins and arteries. And uh, so that's what leads to this eye and kidney problems that you have. So it's very important that you maintain the proper uh, blood sugar levels to, uh, for the long range to stop this problem. Uh, use of medications to control pain and inflammation. You want to do that as prescribed by your healthcare professionals. The thing you want to remember about these medications is they're not going to eliminate the pain, uh, the cause of the pain primarily. Um, they may uh, control the nerve impulses that go to these either centrally in the brain or locally to the point where you're comfortable with them, which allows you to do things like physical therapy and, and make the adjustments you have, you need to have. Uh, but the cause of the pain is not going to go away. So the pain medication is not the solution. It's part of the solution and it allows you to do the other things necessary to eliminate the pain. Um, you're using controlled medications, and uh, these, once you have used all these medications up, you'll need to get rid of them in some way. Uh, it's If you have workmen coming into the house or anybody, um, juveniles, you know, there's a good chance for, for some diversion. And so uh, we don't want to keep you in this stuff around any, any longer than we have to. Next slide, please. The recommended CDC 2019-2021 uh, recommends the following, uh, the influenza, the tetanus, diphtheria, pertussis, shingles, the two vaccines, um, the pneumonia, the menococcal, chickenpox, hepatitis A, B, uh, influenza, and COVID vaccines. These are the normal ones that are prescribed. Now your physicians or practitioners are aware of these guidelines and um, they will be um, reminding you, you know, that you need to have these uh, particular uh, vaccinations at a, 
at their scheduled time. Next slide, please. A couple of uh, sites that you need to go to or can go to uh, for uh, drug interaction checkers. Now, if you have questions about whether this particular medication should be taken with or uh, if they're causing problems, or uh, you can go to one of these three. They're pretty easy to remember, drug.com, drugs.com, uh, WebMD, or RxList, any one of these uh, sites will give you the information you need as far as interactions and uh, any other probably information that you need regarding the medication. Uh, next slide, please. And we're at the end. Um, now, as this is being taped, we won't have any chance to talk about uh, questions and things like that. But if you have any questions, you can go to um, these websites that I had given you, and I'm sure that they can supply the answers that you need. Robin. Hey, Robert, that was great information. In fact, I must admit, I took several notes as you were talking, and some of the things that really resonated with me was that people should document what vitamins or herbal remedies that they're taking because it too can have an interaction with your drugs. But the one that I, I appreciated the most was hearing about making your own list of the medications you're taking and what that medication treats. There are so many times that a caregiver may be left in charge at the last moment, whether it's in a medical emergency and without those lists of medications and what they're being treated for and what the dosages they're taking, it leaves a lot of empty, empty answers for questions that the medical personnel would need when they're being treated right away. So I love that information. It resonated with me. I'll be making those lists today. Good. But I do have a couple of questions for you. Yes. My first one being, what do you view as the important factor regarding medications? What's the one important factor? I think patients need to have a realistic uh, expectation regarding the need one thing and the effectiveness of medications. As an example of this is, and I mentioned it during the slides, is pain medications. Pain medications aren't designed to eliminate the cause of the pain. They're designed to allow you comfort in uh, while you do either physical therapy or other types of uh, therapy other than physical that uh, uh, eliminate the pain. So I, I think here one of them is that you need to be realistic about um, what to expect with your medications. And you can talk to your physicians about that or prescribers. That, that's very good to hear. All right, here's the last question I have. If my medication is too expensive, what are other options that might be available to me? This is a great question because we, um, as I kind of alluded to in the uh, presentation, there are some very expensive medications on the market right now. Um, there are various discount programs that are available. Uh, GoodRx is one that probably comes to mind because you see them on TV all the time. Uh, what they really do is they pass the insurance programs and go directly to the customer. So with insurance programs, you're, uh, as a pharmacy, you're dictated to as far as uh, what you're going to be charging, which particular drug you're going to be using, and the copay that you're going to be using in that particular uh, scenario. Now, what we're finding is that um, as the, the process matures, the insurance process, that uh, drug manufacturers are giving uh, payments for performance to these different insurance companies. And so the drug selected uh, by the drug company may not always be the least expensive op uh, alternative for treatment. Now, if you do work through good RX or a program like this that allows you to bypass the insurance industry and deal directly with what the pharmacy has a usual and customary charge. And that in a lot of cases is going to be less than the copay that you're going to be charging if you get the medication through your insurance program. So that's, that's one of the options that you have. Uh, another one is the uh, compassionate program that a lot of the uh, drug manufacturers have, particularly for the more expensive medications. Now, these are income driven, you know, so if you, uh, they're, they're, you fill out some forms regarding uh, income and your availability to pay, but they are available and they certainly should be used uh, for that. Um, if you have another possible option would be if you have a, a, a treatment regimen that the physician has outlined for you, 
um, talk to them about it. You know, say this medication is expensive and I just really can't afford it. There are medications out there, older medications probably, that are available at less expense, more cost effective than the uh, maybe the newer products that are on the market. And there it really isn't any reason that those medications can't be tried initially in what we call step therapy. And in, in fact, a lot of insurance companies require step therapy for uh, more expensive medications uh, where you actually have to try uh, one or two different brands, uh, less expensive generic forms, before they'll actually pay for the, the uh, trade name product. So, um, you know, that's another option that you would have talking to your physician regarding that. Um, taking, not taking the medication is never a solution. You know, you always want to talk to either your pharmacy or um, the practitioner about maybe a less expensive um, alternative, but you need to take your medication. Thank you very much. Great information, very insightful. I want to tell you, Robert, that I want to thank you for joining us today to share this information on the effects that aging has on medication. So for our viewing audience, if you've enjoyed today's session, please like this post or share it on your page to let others know what you have learned. On behalf of ARP Nebraska, we want to thank you for joining us. Thank you, Robin.